Hello and welcome to our Maritime Impact podcast series. I'm your host, Eric Nyhus, Director Environment for Maritime at DNV. It's been a few months since we last spoke, and there has been plenty happening since then with greenhouse gas regulations for shipping. The EU has taken some very significant strides forward, and we now have both political agreement and regulatory text on key pieces of legislation. So in this episode, we'll be focusing exclusively on the EU with a quick status update on the Emissions Trading System, or ETS, and a deeper dive into the recently agreed Fuel EU Maritime. For those of you who want to hear more about what's happening at the IMO, I can only say that you will have to wait a little bit longer, but we'll be back to provide an IMO update after MPC 80 in July. We hope you enjoy the episode, and now on to the show. Those of you who have been listening to this podcast are aware that I have been talking a fair bit about the EU emissions trading system. In the last series, I went into granular details on what was agreed, so if you need a refresher, I suggest you revisit it. In that episode, I also added a few caveats as to the possibilities of last-minute curveballs being served up. I can now say that those concerns have been laid to rest, with the legal text being published on May 16 as the last step in the legislative process. So does that mean that we're now done with everything fully clear and no outstanding questions? Unfortunately not. So let's take a look at the path forward from here. First and foremost, the Commission's work is by no means done. With the ETS becoming effective for ships as of January 1st, 2024, there is a lot of implementation activity that needs to take place. In all, there are eight pieces of so-called secondary legislation that is now in the process of being developed and finalized. I want to mention the Monitoring, Reporting and Verification Regulation. This has been in place since 2018 and forms the basis for determining the emissions liability under the ETS. However, the ETS decision-making is driving some important changes to the MRV. There is the addition of reporting obligations for methane and nitrous oxides, there are new ship types and sizes. There is a very significant new obligation on company reporting of total emissions that has been added. There are modifications to the mandatory monitoring plans and reporting templates, and so on and so forth. This is work that needs to be done this year to be ready for the ETS coming into effect in 2024. And for the Commission to manage their own internal deadlines, the intent is to have most of this done in time for a four-week public consultation starting mid-July. In practical terms, this means that we can expect to see most of the MRV revisions more or less finalized by then. Secondly, and this is also not to be neglected, we have the complication of all EU member states and EEA countries now having to transpose the ETS legislation into national law and, to avoid legal uncertainty, get it done before the end of this year. For some countries, we expect this to be quite the challenge, as the necessary laws have to go through national legislative bodies, something that can be quite time-consuming. The risk here is that some countries may not be able to meet the deadline, creating all sorts of implementation issues when the new year rolls around. And thirdly, there are all the practicalities that each country has to take care of when setting itself up as a so-called administering authority managing the ETS compliance for ships. While these government bodies have been dealing with ETS for stationary installations and aviation for several years, there are implementation issues that need to be handled to manage the way this is intended to work for shipping. Again, the readiness level can be expected to vary from country to country as we head into 2024. I want to stress that what I've been talking about so far focuses on issues relating to the implementation and legal compliance aspect of the ETS, essentially how to get the whole machine running smoothly and predictably. But there is another aspect to the ETS that also needs to be addressed, and that is its commercial implications. The regulation will require the shipping company, typically the ship manager, to surrender EU allowances, EUAs, based on the annual level of emissions. And EUAs today are priced at around 100 euros per ton CO2, meaning that the cost of emissions can add up to a significant financial liability. Factoring this into commercial contracts between stakeholders to ensure fair distribution of costs will therefore be absolutely crucial. 
From both the compliance and the commercial point of view, the shipping company needs to ensure that it has the ability to meet the EUA surrender obligations generated by its ship operations. As an example, one way to handle this could be for commercial contracts to include an obligation for EUAs, corresponding to the voyage-generated CO2 liabilities, being deposited into the shipping company's carbon account. So to summarize the state of play for the ETS, there are legal implementation issues still outstanding, and there are commercial implications that need to be addressed through contractual arrangements. You'll certainly be hearing more from me on this as we get closer to 2024. So let's move on to the second segment, namely the agreement that has been reached on fuel EU maritime. Formally speaking, the political agreement was reached back in April, and work is still ongoing, hammering out the final text. Once that is done, we have the same process as for the ETS. The European Parliament and the Council of Ministers need to sign off on the text before it gets published in the official journal of the European Union and enters into force. While this is not exactly rubber stamping, I do not expect significant surprises or changes. As with the ETS, there will be secondary legislation developed to deal with implementation aspects. Here there are 15 of these on the books. What this means is that while we do have legislative certainty, there are still a number of implementation issues to be resolved. So what is the fuel EU maritime? It has two core parts. One that from 2025 sets requirements to the yearly average greenhouse gas intensity of energy used on board a ship, measured as CO2 equivalent emissions per energy unit on a life cycle basis. A second part that from 2030 mandates the use of shore power in certain EU ports for certain ship types. Application wise, it applies to ships above 5,000 gross tons transporting cargo or passengers for commercial purposes. This is essentially the same as a present MRV coverage. As for the ETS, it is the shipping company that is responsible for compliance. I'll focus on the energy use part first. Fuel EU works by setting a general baseline for the greenhouse gas intensity of the energy used on board a ship and requiring improvement against that baseline. The baseline is determined from the EU 2020 fuel mix as reported under the MRV. The requirement starts fairly gently with a 2% improvement required in 2025, but ramps up in five yearly increments to an 80% reduction required in 2050. While there are provisions for crediting ships using wind-assisted propulsion, in broad terms this means steadily tightening requirements to the greenhouse gas intensity of the fuel used on board. The regulation covers not only CO2, from day one it also includes methane and nitrous oxide emissions. It covers voyages in a similar way to how the ETS works, covering 100% of energy used on voyages and port calls within the EU, and 50% of energy used on voyages into or out of the EU. It also has a requirement to the mandatory use of so-called renewable fuels of non-biological origin that may kick in in 2034, depending on the total shipping use of such fuels in 2031. To ease the transition to alternative fuels, the regulation contains provisions for fleet pooling, as well as banking of over- and under-compliance. This is subject to certain constraints, but will allow operators to combine low-emission ships with more traditional ones to achieve compliance in their aggregate. Fuel EU penalizes non-compliance by imposing a financial penalty proportional to the compliance deficit, calculated as a difference between the required and actual greenhouse gas intensity, multiplied by the total annual energy use. This penalty quickly becomes significant. There are also provisions for denial of entry to the EU and potential detention in case of two or more repeated years of non-compliance. Peeled down to its core, this regulation is about what you burn, not about how much you burn, which means that traditional energy efficiency measures won't help with compliance. It's designed to pressure ship operators to transition to lower emission fuels, with the pressure ramping up as the reduction requirements tighten. At the end of the day, it is intended to drive an accelerating uptake of alternative low emission fuels, thereby reducing greenhouse gas emissions from ships. 
The second part of the Fuel EU Maritime addresses the use of shore power. From 2030, container ships and passenger ships above 5000 GT are required to connect to shore power for all electrical power demand when at berth for more than two hours in a so-called 10T port. From 2035, the requirement applies to all EU ports where shore power is available. There are a number of exemption provisions, but the penalty for not complying is 1.5 euros per kilowatt hour of the established total electric power demand of the ship at birth, multiplied by hours at birth. This also quickly becomes a significant financial penalty. As a final word, for now, on the fuel EU maritime, it is worth noting that the compliance process will build on its own monitoring, reporting and verification system. While this will be linked to the existing MRV system to facilitate the reuse of relevant elements, it is not yet clear what it will look like in all its details. This is part of the 15 pieces of secondary legislation I mentioned earlier, and I'm sure we will be diving further into this as the details become clearer. So to the key takeaways. As promised in earlier episodes, 2023 is going to be both a hectic and an important year, as we are on the cusp of the ETS entering into force in 2024 and fuel EU maritime in 2025. While a significant amount of implementation work remains, we expect to see the final shape of the ETS implementation within just a few months. When it comes to the fuel EU maritime, I would stress that it would be wise not to let the ETS steal all the attention away from it, despite it being one year further out. We recommend that companies with ships falling within its scope start preparing for the updated monitoring and reporting requirements and strongly advise that companies also start considering how to acquire the necessary fuels. And finally, to provide you with even more details as well as for your reading pleasure, you can find DNV's technical newsletters covering both the ETS and the Fuel EU Maritime on dnv.com forward slash maritime. DNV has also launched its new Emissions Connect service, which makes real-time verified data sets available on a non-aggregated level, ready to be analyzed, exported, and shared with other stakeholders. You can find the links in the show notes or below the podcast on dnv.com forward slash mi. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Maritime Impact Podcast with me, Eric Nyhus. In our next episode, we'll be talking to Tom Strang, Senior Vice President, Maritime Affairs from Carnival Corporation, to get insights from a leading cruise operator on how they are dealing with the EU ETS and other requirements. The remaining episodes will cover the upcoming MEPC 80 meeting and delve into its relevant decisions. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to give us a rating or a review. Thank you for listening.